And uh, this weekend, we celebrate Father's Day. And, uh, and Father's Day is such a, such a unique celebration in the church because typically, like Mother's Day, we roll out the red carpet and we go, moms, you're doing great. We encourage moms. And then Father's Day comes along and it's like, dads, get it together. <laughs> Come on, dads. And uh, we were talking, I want, to give, I want to give credit where credit is due, Randy, I don't know where you are. I was talking to Randy beforehand, and he goes, I realize Father's Day is just a second Mother's Day. And I was like, oh, I want to hear more. Tell me, tell me. He goes, because like Mother's Day comes along, and they're like, hey, why don't you take all the kids and give mom some time to herself? That's Mother's Day. But then Father's Day comes along, and like, don't you want to play with your kids? Don't you want, don't you want to take your kids by yourself? It's just, it's just dual Mother's Day over and over again. And uh, we do want to wish all the dads a Father's Day. And also in this time, uh, just acknowledge uh, that in the same way that Mother's Day can be a difficult day for people, that Father's Day can be a very difficult day for people. And, um, and I've been just kind of open anew to that understanding over the last couple of years as I've had conversations with close friends of the hurts they have from their father and the, at times the non-existent relationships they have with their father. And so to acknowledge that on the front end. And um, I just want to say uh, this message is gonna be a little different. And I know some of you are thrown off because you're like, we didn't, we didn't stand for the reading of scripture. What's the title? I need, I've got my notes, there's no title. And, and you may, like 98% of you may not care that there's a title. Just humor me and pretend like you care that there would be a title. Uh, but uh, that's, not, that's not today. Today's gonna be a little different. And uh, this is why I, I just find that about, I, I used to think this was kind of a one-time thing, but I've traced it back in my ministry, and I've realized about, about every 18 months or about every two years, I just kind of need to have a message that is just about everything. <laughs> and, uh, and I have a group of guys that pray with me before the message, and they always just say, what's the message about? Where are we landing? What do we need to pray for? And so... I can give that clearly. Hey, here's the title. Here's the topic. This is the application. Let's go pray for this. And I met with them beforehand. They're like, what's it about? It's about everything. Okay. <laughs> and, and they started their prayer with, uh, God help them, <laughs> which, which is a good place to start anyway. Just say, don't worry, don't worry. And, um, and I, I want to share this at the start because when it, whenever this kind of happens, this is my trust. Uh, my trust is that even within uh, everything that we're going to talk about, that God will speak clearly to you and that God has something for you that he is drawing you into closer to himself within this. And on a, a Monday of this past week, uh, leading into Father's Day, uh, I received a call from my father. I was sitting at home and I got a call from my dad. And the call from my dad was to let me know that my grandfather had passed away. And uh, my grandfather stands in our family as a hero in the faith. Like, he has a legacy of faith that just, just is massive. Uh, but there was something unique that happened within that moment. And I also want to acknowledge, like, this is a piece of saying, uh, my grandpa is 95 years old, was 95 years old. My grandmother had passed about six months ago. And I, I know within those pieces that are like when it's like, it, it's always sad, but you can also say like, it's time. Like, it's time. I'm glad for us. I'm glad for him that this happened. And that's not a morbid thing. As Christians, we are not afraid of death. And so it was, this is good. This is a good thing. But, but within that moment of the phone call, there was something, I, I'm not going to say disturbing, but it was almost, I don't know, it was almost eerie in, in terms of how it happened, uh, that my dad calls me up to let me know that his dad had passed away. So my dad is calling his son to let him know, but also looking for comfort in those moments, looking, looking for some just kind of assurance, looking for some peace. And as I'm, as I'm on the phone talking to my father, trying to give him comfort, my son walks in the door and just stands in the doorway. And I'm talking to my dad, trying to comfort him about his dad passing away, having the realization that someday I will call my son to let him know that my dad passed away. 
looking for comfort in the same moment. And maybe, maybe someday, my son will call his son looking for comfort to let him know that I passed away. And, and maybe, I mean, the, the reality is that's a long shot because he's got relational problems at three and I really don't know how any of that's gonna work out. So, so we've at least got two down that it's gonna happen. <laughs> but there was, there's something within this moment that, that just gave me this, this deep understanding of, of legacy. And it, you, you have like so many moments in our lives are so hurried and so quick and we have to run to the next thing. And then you have a moment like that and it just kind of stops you in your tracks. And, and as I talked to my father about my grandfather's legacy of faith, there were some things that became so clear to me that, that when we think over the long term, when we, when we think of these massive words like legacy, what is the legacy you want to leave over the duration of your entire life? What, what is that? What do you want to be remembered for? What do you want to pass on? It feels overwhelming to even discuss it, but this is the thing that I found in the moment, is that legacy thinking actually clarifies life. That it is, it is the short-term thinking in which things get so confusing. It, it is in the moment in which we're rushing around and we have a thousand things to do and a thousand things to go to, and if anyone would grab you at that moment and say, what matters most? You go, well, like the milk in the car, <laughs> like it needs to get in the fridge and, and the kids need to get out of the road and all these other things. And, and when we think short term, what we find is that our, our thinking is actually far more confused. But when we think over the long term, it clarifies, it, it makes priority, it makes legacy a very, very simple conversation and, and the legacy that my grandfather passed down to his entire family is a legacy of faith. And, and so I sat there for a couple of moments and I was thinking through, like, why is that? Why did he pass down a legacy of faith? Why did we all inherit this faith? And, and the answer wasn't confusing. It was because his, his faith was constant. His faith was always there. And, and, and legacy is about what we consistently do. Your legacy that you will leave when someone calls someone else to let them know the news is about what you consistently do. Not what you desire. Not what you wish for. Not what you hope for. Not even what you passionately do. Uh, I love Angela Duckworth in her book, Grit. She says this, she says, enthusiasm is common, endurance is rare. And, and it's as much as I believe it is important, especially within our faith, that we have a level of emotion and a level of excitement, that, it, that that isn't the piece in which legacy comes forth. Legacy is about what you consistently do. And, and I wonder what that means for our faith. That if we are going to leave legacies of faith, it must be about consistent action over time. Time is the great multiplier in all of life. And, and you, can, you can make up for a massive lack of energy by simply being consistent over time. And over about the, I'll say about the last 18 months, um, I've, been, I've been working on a book about how people lose their faith and, and how people over time, they just get to a spot in which they no longer believe. And as I've done all of this research and all of this study, um, I've, I've, learned, I've learned a word. There you go, 18 months, I learned a word. Congratulations, I could have just gone to Merriam-Webster's word of the day and that would have been it and saved myself all the struggle. Uh, but the word I learned throughout all of this was the word inoculation, inoculation. And, and it means to, to I'm, I'm not a scientist, okay, so this is my, I talked about friction last week, and I felt nervous within that, like, someone's going to correct me, I know someone's going to correct me, I know I've got pharmacists who are in our church, and they're like, oh, here we go, but, but this word inoculation being, uh, when, when you present 
a, a substance or some form into an organism for the purpose of it creating antibodies. A vaccine is an example of the process of inoculation. When you don't want to have a disease and they present a vaccine into your body, what they're doing is they're presenting a very, very small dose of this virus so that your body presents, can create the antibodies in order for it to resist it, in order for it to fight it. And, and I know this may sound like a weird word in the context of the development of faith, but what I believe has happened is I believe that we have inoculated our faith. That, that what has happened over time in our culture is that we have, we have instead of, as Jesus calls us, to, to follow him, to, to over the duration of our lives, hear his call and trust and obey to enter with, with almost reckless abandonment into the relationship that Jesus invites us into. What, what we've done instead all too often is we've dipped our toe in the faith and then walked away. And it, and it looks like this. We go, we go to church every once in a while. We, we read our scripture when we happen to have 10 minutes of spare time and the Bible was already in our lap, which is pretty rare, just to be clear. We pray when there's a devastating crisis. And that there's, there's all these things that were once meant to be the lifeblood of the people of God. And, and, and what happens is, is that instead of jumping in fully into the life that God invites us into, we've just, we've just tested it, and we've just, we've just touched it, and we've just tried it. And, and it didn't really transform anything because it was just a touch. It didn't really change anything because it was just a little bit. And then, and then we'll increase the dosage a little bit, and we'll go a little and do a little more and pray a little more, and nothing really happens in our lives. And we assume that something is wrong with God. And over time, we become, Scripture refers to it like this, we become resistant to the work of the Holy Spirit. And we walk into houses of worship, or we open the pages of our Bible, and it doesn't really seem to speak to us. We don't really seem to feel anything anymore. And we think it's God, but, but I think what happens over time is we have, in essence, created an immunity to the work of the Holy Spirit. We've created an immunity to God in our lives. Throughout the Bible, they referred to this as when people, their hearts grew hard, that they heard the word of the Lord but they didn't respond. And they heard the word of the Lord and they didn't respond until eventually it got to the point where they would no longer hear the word of the Lord. Legacy is what you consistently do, not what you want, not what you wish for, what, not what you hope for, not even, not even what you pray for. Legacy is what you consistently do. And there's, a, there's a, one, one verse of scripture that I want to look at in our time together. And I, I just want to tell you, even referencing this passage of scripture kind of terrifies me. And I promise you, this is the only time in my entire life that I will preach on this verse of scripture. And I know some of you are like, oh, but God. And I'm like, ah, oh, but no. Like, like, this is it. This is the one time. And it comes out of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 21. And it says this, you cannot drink from the cup of the Lord and from the cup of demons too. You cannot eat at the Lord's table and at the table of demons too. And I know we hear that and we're like, what is going on in Corinth? Which if you spend some time reading Paul's letter to the Corinthians, that is all you would ever say. Like, what is going on in Corinth? And, and what has happened, if I could give a little background to this, is uh, the people in the church in Corinth, one of the common practices in this day and age was that they would offer food to idols. 
They would take animals, sacrifice them, and offer food to the idols, these statues that they had created, that they would bow down and worship at, which we think, how ridiculous, how preposterous. Uh, but it's a little more common than we'd think. But they would take these, this food and offer it. And then what would happen is the people who were Christians would go and they would eat the food just like those who were worshiping the idols. And, and Paul hears this and he's like, what are you, what are you doing? Like, what are you doing? <laughs> and, and they make this like case that you can tell from his writing. They make this case of like, well, nothing's wrong with the food. And, and Paul gives this brilliant line later on, later in 1 Corinthians, if you want to read it on your own. And he says, yes, yes. You, that, is, that is permissible for you to eat the food. Yes, there's nothing, nothing is wrong with the food. Nothing changes the food. If I could give a man a 21st century example, when I was a teenager, I wasn't allowed to listen to secular music. Ooh, secular music. We were only allowed to listen to Christian music. And so this is what we had. We had a poster in my youth group that said, these are the secular bands, and here is the equivalent Christian band. But they weren't really equivalent. It was like the like 50% as good as version of the secular band. But it was like, if your friends listen to this, you should listen to this. <laughs> and it was this idea of like, oh yeah, this is what is gonna help us know the Lord. This is the key thing that's gonna change our lives. And Paul makes this statement that is so important. He goes, yes, you have, you have permission to do that. Absolutely. There is nothing wrong with you doing that. But then he clarifies and he says, while everything is permissible, not everything is beneficial. While you have a right, while you have freedom to do almost anything, the question is not can you, the question is should you. The question is not are you able to, the question is, is this good for you? Is this good for others? And Paul goes on even further and he says, listen, here's the deal. Those of you who are leaders, you are accountable for how others look at you and the actions that they take from the things that they see in your life. While it may not be an issue for you, it may be an issue for someone else. And you should never be a stumbling block to someone else in the faith because you weren't mindful of what is beneficial. And it all comes in this powerful statement. If we could see it once more on the screen, then we're gonna make it go away. You cannot drink from the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot eat at the Lord's table and at the table of demons too. And this is what I find. That we have two cups. Full disclosure in case if anyone's nervous. Apple juice, cherry Kool-Aid, okay? This is, as, this is as hard as it gets for me in my life. Apple juice, cherry Kool-Aid. I needed the color contrast within there. And, and at first, if I, would, if I would take a drink. Man, I love Kool-Aid. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> There's a distinct taste. And if I, if I keep drinking, the, the taste actually doesn't grow duller it's enhanced. At first, just to be, not, not to be gross, but I, like, I still taste my mouth. <laughs> but then I keep drinking it and I can taste it more and more and fuller and fuller every single time. And then when I, when I mix it with a different cup and a different drink, I, I taste that clearly. I taste it clearly. But then when I go back here, Now I kind of taste this. And, and I took a dr drink, like you saw me, <laughs> definitively from this cup. And I never mixed the two, but it no longer has a distinct taste. I, I can no longer taste the, clearly what was in this cup because it's gotten so intermixed with everything else. And, and there's this word that honestly in my faith used to terrify me, and it's this word distinct, distinct, because when I was younger, the word distinct was used so much about Christians and Christianity and faith, and it was this idea that we are called to be distinct, 
And what that meant was I couldn't go to the movies that all my friends were going to, and I couldn't listen to the bands all my friends were listening to. And I, I hated this word distinct. But, but what I have found over time is that this word distinct is an important word, but not how it was used when I was growing up. See, to be distinct in our faith is not, is not simply what we don't do. But to be distinct in our faith is far more clearly about who we are as a people. Jesus speaks of it like this. He says, you are the salt of the earth. You, you are the thing that enhances all of the good in the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? Jesus says, you are the light of of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. John later on says, the light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. The darkness has not overcome it. Like as as Christians, as people of faith, the calling is to be distinct. it's It's to shine a light on a world that is otherwise so dark, but the distinction can't come Let me make that clear. The distinction can't come if a quarter of our lives we look to Jesus for fulfillment and if the rest of our lives we're looking to our accomplishments or the praise of others. The distinction can't come if we go like, in a moment, Jesus will save me, Jesus will fulfill me, and then in the next moment we say, but retail feels really good right now. No, it can't come. And we can no longer taste what the cup of the Lord tastes like. And it tastes like the rest of the world. And so we have these moments within our distinction in which the rest of the world says this, says this banner of be kind, be kind, which is great. I mean, sure, we should be kind. But, but as people of faith, we're called to love. Like where, where the rest of the world only can muster up this ability to be, to be courteous to those around you, and that is the height That is the height of their other-centeredness. As people of faith, we are called to be sacrificial at the core. And we can't do that if we're constantly switching cups. We're in this moment within our culture right now in which this word justice is so incredibly important, and it is. This word justice, what does justice look like in our society? What does justice look like in our nation? And, and, I, and I watch, oh man, I watch as our country is literally tearing itself apart. And, and as I have conversations with my friends and people in our church who are black and their concern for their families and their concern for their kids and their acceptance and the racism that they have experienced on their own end. And as I have friends in law enforcement who are scared for their lives and scared for their families, and I watch all this play out on a massive scale. And I'm not, I'm not equipped to fully comment on all that I'm far too ignorant of so much. But there's also this piece within me, and if I could say uh, words that make me uncomfortable, that will probably make you uncomfortable, just so we have a heads up on that, is there is a, there is a sexy justice in our world. That was the word. <laughs> there's, there's a justice that is appealing to speak about, that is culturally appropriate to talk about. But then there's this whole other justice that just gets forgotten. There's this whole other justice that no one seems to care about. And we have this back and forth on my social media news feed, which just social media, I'm out. (laughs) Like, I'll contribute. I'm not consuming. I'm good. 
of who lives, whose lives matter. And then and I hear these things like in, in Ohio, 70% of the deaths from COVID have taken place in nursing homes. 70%. 20% of the people who have been infected by this virus were infected while in prison. And I look at that and I go, there is something very, very wrong there. Like there is something very, very wrong no one seems to care. And, and my co great concern for the church as a whole is that when we lose our distinction, we lose our voice. And I had a friend from years ago who posted this, and um, he, he posted this meme. And the meme said this. It said, as for me in my house, we will stand before the flag. We will salute the anthem. And I couldn't even read the rest. And, and that may be where you stand. And if that's where you stand, that's fine. Like, that's fine. But, but what happened in that moment is they took a verse of Scripture and the call that Joshua gives to the nation of Israel, and he says, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. And what happened is they took this incredible verse of Scripture calling us to drink only from this cup, and they tried to pour a whole bunch of other stuff into it. And there's no distinction. I don't even know what that's meant to be. And when we live our lives in such a way that we don't realize what is Jesus and what is everything else, we can't expect Jesus to heal us. And there's this part that has always just amazed me about Christian history. And what happens is in, in the early centuries, there is this incredible plague that sweeps through the Roman Empire that honestly, other than the fire, destroys the Roman Empire as much as anything else. And people are fleeing the city of Rome. Like they are fleeing the city of Rome because they are terrified for this, from this plague. And Dionysius, one of the third century historians, gives this detail. He says, everyone fled the city except the Christians. The Christians ran into the city and helped the sick and dying, oftentimes taking their diseases upon themselves and dying as well. Guys, this is where hospitals came from. Hospitals were non-existent before this. The idea that when someone is sick, we should help them, they began because when people were struggling, the Christians ran into the city, unafraid for their own personal safety. And I, and I look at the world today and I go, I don't know if the church still has that voice. Or as people who claim to follow Christ, have we all just bowed down at the altar at the idol that says our personal safety comes above all else. And, and I look at my own life and the things that I value in the way in which that I live, and I go, I don't know, I don't know if we still have sacrifice in us. We may be too smart for sacrifice. We may be too smart for suffering. And I go like the Apostle Paul says, he gives this line within the page of the scripture that he says, I, I survived all these things. I survived 40 lashes, minus, 40 lashes minus one this many times. I was shipwrecked three times. And I read that and I go, Paul, stay off a boat. <laughs> like, I mean, after one, stay off a boat, Paul. Don't quit doing that. And I go, even within my own life, am I too smart to sacrifice? Am I too smart that when someone else does acts of mercy to someone else, that instead of in being inspired by the love and compassion that's there, would I simply call out, that's dumb. That's stupid. And I say this because we have friends, we have people that we know who have been infected with this virus 
this contagious, dangerous virus. And I'm, I'm not making a statement on our personal safety, but, but I've watched as people have treated them like lepers. And instead of valuing the individual for who they are and proclaiming the worth of everyone, get out of my hair, stay away, my personal safety comes above all else. And so much of this for me is the sense that for our church, oh, for our church, I am so very proud of who we are. I am so very proud of the things that we've done. I am in a good way proud of the reputation that we have, proud of the things that we've been called to, proud of the sacrifices that we have made together. But the legacy of this church, the legacy of who we are as a people, it must be more than good services. It must be more than good people. It must be more than good deeds. It must be sacrifice. It must be this understanding that we are willing in moments of injustice to be misunderstood by those around us to say what is right. It must be that, that we are willing to get a little bloody. We're willing to get bruised and battered at times in order to step forward in what Jesus is clearly calling us into. And we cannot do that if our faith is not distinct and our faith will never be distinct if it is not constant. Legacy comes from what we consistently do. And I had a, I don't know if this is a familiar phrase to you uh, as a pastor. People tell me the weirdest things and I've got this skewed view of reality. So I really don't know what's common or what's not. Like, I mean, we're all still watching perfect strangers on TV, right? Like that's a thing. Okay. And this guy, this guy came up to me recently, and he made this statement about church, and he said, well, I don't have to, just because just I'm in a garage doesn't mean I'm a car. Went, what? <laughs> just because I'm, I'm in a garage doesn't mean I'm a car. And I had to quickly put together what he was saying. He said, oh, I get it, I get it. You're saying just because you're in church doesn't mean you're a Christian. He went, right, right, just because I'm a I'm in a garage doesn't mean I'm a car, and I don't have to be in a garage to be a car. I was like, what? This is getting too deep for me. Like, I, I park in the driveway. <laughs> And, and, and I, finally, I finally grasped the, like the metaphor is supposed to make the truth simple. <laughs> I was like, I am so complicated, I'm so confused right now. But it was this statement of like, just because I'm in church doesn't mean I'm a Christian. And if I'm not a church, doesn't mean I'm not a Christian. I went, I agree, I agree. But there is a massive difference between simply, simply church as a Christian in terms of attend, which is not in any way what this message is about, if I could be clear. It has nothing to do with that and who you are. See, a, a Christian is not one who attends. A, a Christian is one who worships God and works to the good to redeem the world and partner God with God in that in everything they do in all of their lives. It is that the praise of God is not a Sunday thing. The praise of God is a constant thing. And that resurrection is not a thing that happened 2,000 years ago. The resurrection is a thing that is happening in every arena, in every part of our lives. That we seek the resurrection of relationships and economies and people groups and all of these things to the end until Jesus returns. That is what it means to be a Christian. And so, because I thought I was really funny, <laughs> I responded back to this guy, you're right. But if a car doesn't run, is it still a car? <laughs> like if a car's just sitting in your driveway and it can't turn on and go anywhere, isn't it just an oversized lawn ornament? I lost him there. <laughs> it was like, only you can do the confusing metaphors. <laughs> 
But as we talked through it, it was this sense of what it means to follow Jesus. What it means to follow Jesus. It's to know the life that God offers you. And to wholeheartedly step into that. Not to, not to hear a little bit of the advice that Jesus gives you and try to apply it as you do everything else. No, 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 no. It says, taste and see that the Lord is good. And if you have diluted the cup of the Lord with everything else in the world, you will never know that it is the Lord who is good. And we have this gospel, gospel, good news that Jesus died on the cross for our sins and was resurrected three days later, that we would know the life that God offers for us. And this gospel is distinct. It is distinct. It is not self-help. It is resurrection. It is not politics. It is justice. It is not be kind. It is be loving and show grace and mercy in every arena of your life. And if we are going to have the voice as a church that the world needs us to have, then we must be constant in our faith. And we must know who God is. And so as my family discussed the legacy of my grandfather, we were sharing stories and going back and forth. And there's this one piece of my grandfather that I, I had honestly forgotten about. That when every single one of us grandkids, uh, when we were, got engaged and were going to get married, my grandfather interviewed the fiance. He interviewed the person who was gonna come into the family. And it, it's one of those things, like you don't realize how weird your family is until you removed it from a few years. Like, I just thought that's what grandparents did. Like, of course your grandpa would interview the fiance. Like Bethany's grandparents didn't, but they're weird. My family's normal, this makes sense. And I can remember at my uh, older sister's graduation party, her uh, boyfriend at the time, but serious boyfriend was there and we knew they were headed down that path and my grandpa came in and sat next to him in the middle of our kitchen. He's sitting on a cooler and my grandpa sat next to him on the cooler in the middle of our kitchen. So is, there is this whole party going on. Like all of these people are around, it was a lively party. I mean, there was apple juice and cherry Kool-Aid, but it was a lively party that we had. And my grandpa sits next to now my brother-in-law and he begins the interview with this. So, do you know Jesus as your personal savior? I just thought this is how conversation started. <laughs> this is why I have such a difficult time doing chit chat and small talk. I just thought this is how we talk. Do you know Jesus as your personal savior? Do you know him? And with every single person who married into my family, do you know Jesus as your personal savior? Do you know him? Do you know the cup that brings life versus the cup that brings dullness? Do you know the cup that heals instead of the cup that simply numbs? And so I ask you tonight, do you know not have you been to church? Not have you read the Bible? Do you know Jesus? Do you know the Jesus who promises purpose for your life? Do you know the Jesus who promises rest? Or has Christianity just become another activity that gets stacked onto your hurried life that gets dropped in a moment? Because if that is the faith that you're living, there will be no legacy because it will get dropped as soon as things get busy. I want you to have a legacy. I want the day, oh, the day. As morbid as it sounds, but as Christians, we do not fear death. I want the day that your kid or your close friend calls up someone else to receive comfort at your passing 
I want the first thing that comes to their mind to be your unshakable faith. I invite you, if you would, would you stand with me together? And I'm going to ask this. Would you bow your head in this moment and close your eyes for a second? And I just want to ask you some questions. Are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you stretched? Are you hurried? Do you know fulfillment? Do you know love? I ask you this really pressing question. Do you still hold on to this idea that the right politics will turn our nation around to where it should be? Do you still hold on to the thought that the person who sits in elected office is more significant than the one who sits on the throne? Is your soul weary and burdened? And I want you to know within all those things that it is Jesus who gives you rest. I invite you, if you would, would you take both hands and just place them before you with your hands open and your palms turned towards heaven. And I want you to understand in this posture that there is not one single thing that your God wants from you. It is only what he wants for you. That your relationship with Jesus is not another task. It's not another item. It's not another activity. As Augustine said so many years ago, our hearts are restless until they rest in you. And in this moment, I want you to find rest. I want you to find fulfillment. I want you to taste and see that the Lord is good. Heavenly Father, in this moment, I pray over every individual. Father, legacies are shaped in a moment. They must endure for a lifetime, but they are shaped in a moment. May this be a moment in which lives are transformed, in which hearts are healed, in which souls are restored and minds are renewed. Father, Father, my prayer is that you would do the work that only you can do. There are so many things that can grab our attention, but there is only one who can satisfy. There are so many things in our lives that can make a big noise, but only you, only you restore, only you resurrect, only you heal. I invite you in this moment to offer your own prayer to God, to ask him to be in your soul, to ask him to heal whatever needs healed, and that we know that he is never far. And so ask him to be close in this moment.